across to the United Nations where President Cyril Ramaphosa is addressing. Mandate to foster peace and promote fundamental human rights, to promote social progress and to ensure that there's a better standard of life for all. And yet, as we gather here, much of humanity is confronted by war and conflict, by want and hunger, by disease and environmental damage and disaster. Solidarity and trust between states is being eroded. Inequality, poverty, and unemployment are deepening across many nations in the world. In these conditions, and in the wake of a devastating global pandemic, the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals seem increasingly remote. At the moment when every human effort should be directed towards the realization of Agenda 2030, our attention and our energies have once again been diverted by the scourge of war. But these woes, these divisions, these seemingly intractable troubles can and must be overcome. Over millennia, the human race has demonstrated an enormous capacity for resilience, for an ability to resolve problems, for adaptation, innovation, compassion, and solidarity. At this moment, we are all called upon to reaffirm these essential qualities that define our common humanity. These qualities must be evident in how we work together as a global community and as nations of the world to end war and conflict. South Africa has consistently advocated for dialogue, for negotiation and diplomacy to prevent and end conflict and achieve lasting peace. It has committed itself as a country to the promotion of human rights, human dignity, justice, democracy, and to the adherence of international law. From the experience of our own journey, from the evil system of apartheid, which was declared a crime against humanity by this very organization, to democracy, we value the importance of engaging all parties to conflicts to achieve peaceful, just, and enduring solutions. It is these principles that inform South Africa's participation in the African Peace Initiative, which seeks a peaceful resolution of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. In this conflict, as in all conflicts, we have insisted that the UN Charter's principle of respect for the territorial integrity of every country should be upheld. Our participation in the African Peace Initiative, supported by seven countries from the African continent, is informed by a desire to see an end to the suffering of those most directly affected by the conflict and the millions on our own continent and across the world who, as a result of the conflict, are now vulnerable to worsening hunger and deprivation. As we engaged with the parties in this conflict as African leaders, one of the issues we raised was that there should be confidence-building measures that could create a sense of conflict
towards the resolution of this conflict. In this regard, we said issues such as the return of the children who were removed from Ukraine should be returned. We also said that the prisoners of war should be exchanged between the two countries. I've just held a meeting with President Zelensky who says that in part some of our efforts are bearing fruit as the children are now being returned and the prisoners are also being exchanged. But then we said we need to see this happening on a much faster pace. As the international community, we must do everything within our means to enable meaningful dialogue, just as we should refrain from any actions that fuel conflict. As we confront other conflicts in several parts of the world, including on our own continent, Africa, we need to be investing in prevention and peace building. We support the call by the UN Secretary General in the new agenda for peace for member states to provide more sustainable and predictable financing for peace building efforts. As a global community, we should be concerned by the recent incidents of unconstitutional changes of government in some parts of Africa. The global community needs to work alongside the African Union to support peace efforts in the DRC, in Libya, Sudan, Somalia, Mali, Central African Republic, South Sudan, North Mozambique, the Great Lakes region, the Sahel, Niger, and the Horn of Africa. The African Union Peace and Security Council has declared that it stands ready to deepen its cooperation with the UN Security Council to silence the guns on the African continent and to achieve peace and stability and development. We are called upon to remain true to the founding principles of the United Nations by recognizing the inalienable right of the people of Western Sahara for self-determination in line with the relevant UN General Assembly resolutions. We must work for peace in the Middle East for as long as the land of the Palestinians remains occupied, for as long as their rights are ignored and their dignity is denied, such peace will remain elusive. The actions of the government of Israel have imperiled the possibility of a viable two-state solution. The principles of the UN Charter on territorial integrity and on the prohibition of the annexation of land through the use of force must be applied in this situation as well. South Africa continues to call for the lifting of the economic embargo that was imposed 60 years ago against Cuba, an embargo that has caused untold damage to the country's economy and the people of Cuba as well. The sanctions that are also being applied against South Africa's neighbor, Zimbabwe, should also be lifted as they are imposing untold suffering on ordinary Zimbabweans, but also have a collateral negative impact on neighboring countries as well, such as my own country, South Africa. As many people around the world are confronted by hunger and want, we are required to focus on targeted investment, on technology transfer, capacity building support, especially in key areas such as supporting industrialization, 
building infrastructure, ensuring that agriculture investment takes place, ensuring that there is investment in water, energy, education, and health. This also requires predictable and sustainable financial support, including supportive trade policies from the international community. We call on the partners of the wealthier countries to meet the financial commitments they have made. It is a matter of great concern to us from the Global South that these wealthier countries in the Global North have failed to meet the undertakings they made to provide $100 billion a year for developing economies to take climate action. This must be changed and the money must be made available in the interest of development. We support the proposals outlined in the Secretary General's Sustainable Development Goal Stimulus. In particular, we support the call to tackle debt and debt distress that many countries, particularly in the Global South, are burdened by. And we support the call to massively scale up affordable long-term financing to $500 billion a year and to expand contingency financing to countries that are in need. It is a grave indictment on this international community that we can spend so much money on war. And in fact, trillions are being spent on war, but we cannot support action that needs to be taken to meet the basic needs of billions of people in the world, needs such as addressing hunger, health, empowering women, and making sure that there is development in countries that are vulnerable. The achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals depends fundamentally on the empowerment of women in all spheres of life. Social and economic progress will not be possible unless we end gender discrimination. We must ensure that there is equal access for women to health care, education, as well as economic opportunities. We must pay particular attention to the provision of adequate ser health services to every woman, child, and adolescent. By doing so, we will fundamentally improve the health and well-being of all. The empowerment of women must be central to the actions we now take towards the realization of Agenda 2030. The women of the world need empowerment. They have a right to empowerment. They have a right also to participate equally in decision-making structures of all institutions in the world. I am proud that in South Africa, 50% of the members of the Cabinet of South Africa are women. And today I'm accompanied by an all-women delegation to this United Nations General Assembly. It should be a matter of concern to us all that the majority of people who are sitting in this assembly are men. The question we have to ask, where are the women of the world? The women of the world have a right to be here to represent the views of women across the world. The essential human qualities of innovation and adaptation must be evident 
in the actions we take to prevent the destruction of our planet. Africa is warming faster than the rest of the world. We are told that the 20 climate hotspots in the world that we have, we find 17 of them in Africa. Africa is least responsible for the climate damage that has been caused and yet it bears the greatest burden. Centuries after the end of the slave trade, decades after the end of the colonial exploitation of Africa's resources, the people of our continent are once again bearing the cost of industrialization of the North and the development of the wealthy nations of the world. This is a price that the people of Africa are no longer prepared to pay. Many countries in the North count their assets in the mineral resources that are beneath the African soil. The wealth of Africa belongs to Africans. The mineral wealth that is beneath the soil of Africa must, in the end, accrue to Africans. We urge global leaders to accelerate the global decarbonization while pursuing equality and shared prosperity. We need to advance all three pillars of the Paris Agreement, mitigation, adaptation, and support, with equal ambition and urgency. African countries, alongside other developing economic countries, need increased financial support to both implement the 2030 Agenda and to achieve their climate change goals in a comprehensive and integrated manner. We need to operationalize the loss and damage fund for vulnerable countries hit hard by climate disasters as agreed at COP27. Africa has embraced this challenge. Africa is determined to deploy smart, digital and efficient green technologies to expand industrial production, to boost agricultural yields, to drive growth and create sustained employment for Africa's people. As the global community, we must ensure the essential qualities that define our humanity are evident in the institutions that manage the conduct of international relations. We require institutions that are inclusive, that are representative, that are democratic, and advance the interests of all nations. We require a renewed commitment to multilateralism based on clear rules and supported by effective institutions. This is the moment to proceed with the reform of the United Nations Security Council to give meaning to the principle of the sovereign equality of nations and to enable the Council to respond more effectively to current geopolitical realities. We are pleased that the common African position on the reform of the Security Council is increasingly enjoying wide support. This process must move to text-based negotiations, creating an opportunity for convergence between member states. The recently held BRICS summit in Johannesburg also affirmed the view that the United Nations Security Council should be reformed and should ensure that those who are not represented, that is nations that are not represented, are also represented. We must ensure that the voice of the African continent and the global south is strengthened in the United Nations and broader multilateral system. All the peoples represented here in this United Nations had their origins in Africa. 
In Africa, they developed the tools and capabilities to spread across the world and achieved remarkable feats of development and progress. And all this was due to the skills and the talent that originated from the African continent. Despite its history, despite the legacy of exploitation, colonialism, and subjugation, Despite the ongoing challenge of conflict and instability, Africa is determined and ready to regain its position as a site of human progress. The era of African development has arrived. Through the African continental free trade area, which is creating a wider, seamless trading area and also accelerated interconnectivity. African countries are mobilizing their collective means and resources to achieve shared prosperity. Through this treaty, African countries are establishing for themselves the foundation for a massive increase in trade, accelerated infrastructure development, regional integration, and sustainable industrialization. As the global community, we have the means and we have the desire to confront and overcome enormous challenges that face humanity today. As the nations gathered here in this General Assembly, let us demonstrate that we have both the will as well as the resolve to secure a peaceful, prosperous and sustainable future for our world, but more importantly, for future generations that will follow, leaving no one behind. That is the duty that we all now have. I thank you. I wish to thank the President of the Republic of South Africa for the statement. All right, so there you have it. Uh, live from New York, President Cyril Ramaphosa speaking to the United Nations General Assembly. And the focus really of his speech, looking at those sustainable development goals which are meant to be achieved by 2030. There's 17 of them, among them ending world poverty, world hunger. Um, and the President's point up front is we are so distracted by wars and spending so much money on wars, we are not prepared, it seems, to spend the money that is needed uh, to pull us out of poverty, to change inequality, to improve the plight of many women across the world, to deal decisively with climate change problems. So a very strong message coming from President Ramaphosa. Um, interestingly, on the war in Ukraine, he said that he's met with the Ukrainian president in the last few days and he can report that children are being returned to Ukraine. Prisoners are now being swapped, but he says it needs to happen quickly. Um, and he did make a point of saying that they support, he supports, as a South Africa, the UN Charter of Respect for Territorial Integrity of each country. He says that has to be upheld. So lots uh, to unpack. Uh, but what he said of note, uh, bearing in mind the guest that I have in studio, climatologist, as uh, J.C. Engelbrecht, is what he said about climate change. We are going to be speaking about what we saw over the weekend um, with the massive uh, spring tide. Um,